Thank you. I'll be talking about the archives later on, but I've got a few things to say before that. When, when one has lived on this planet for over 80 years, there are bound to be many uh, memories in a think tank, and I would like to share some of those with you today. I was an evacuee, first to French Morocco, and then to war-torn London. So I suppose you could say that there, but for the grace of God, go I. Now, since I was only two at the time, uh, my memories of the war years are very sketchy. However, I do have very vivid memories of life in post-war Gibraltar in the 1950s. And looking around the audience, I'm sure that some of the things I have to say will t trigger some memories in their minds as well. Now, the more fortunate evacuees uh, were housed in the newly uh, constructed Alameda housing estate, still known to this day as Humphreys, uh, after the name of the contractor. But others, including my family, were not so lucky and continued to live in pre-war accommodation in the upper town. I sometimes wonder how present-day Gibraltarians would react to the living conditions there. For a start, we had no running water, no turning on of the ta taps, uh, and certainly no bathroom, obviously. So every day, we remember rightly, around 2 p.m. in the afternoon, a lady who was one of the neighbors appointed by the city council would blow her whistle, which was the signal for the neighbors to pick up their buckets and trudge to the communal fountains at the end of the patio. Again, if my memory serves me right, the cost was one old penny for every two buckets. The water was then deposited in a large earthenware receptacle known as a tinaja, uh, in a specially designated area known as El Lavadero. From there, families would draw their daily needs, uh, and for the weekly wash, one used a metal bath, also stored in the lavadero, and the water was heated by means of the coal furnace in the kitchen, which incidentally also served as the living room. Toilets were communal. In our case, one toilet served four families. And if you had to go after dark, you needed to take a candle with you because there was no light inside the toilet. Needless to say, we had no telephone, no television set, and certainly no iPads. <laughs> and yet, as children, we lived happy and contented lives, making our own entertainment. So I suppose it is, as the saying goes, what the eye doesn't see, the heart doesn't yearn for. Today, it is wonderful to see so many young Gibraltarian boys and girls going to university. In the mid-90s, that privilege was restricted to two individuals per year. There was the Government Scholarship and the Victoria McIntosh Scholarship. There were other lesser bursaries for teacher training. I've sometimes reflected how many of deserving John Gibraltarians of my generation missed out because of this. Now, at the end of my schooling years, I had an important decision to make. Will I apply for the two big ones or settle for one of the teacher bursaries. I knew that the competition for the former would be fierce, so I went along to the Department of Education to ask for advice, and the advice given on reflection was pretty obvious, uh, has stayed with me all my life. Uh, if you don't apply, you won't get it. And so I applied. And a very vivid memory concerns the day when I was coming down from Sacred Heart Terrace, where the old grammar school used to be, uh, and down the steps by the old police barracks to find my mother picking the daily supply of water, but also clutching a letter. Uh, it was addressed to me, but of course she'd already opened it. Uh, it. It informed me that I had been awarded the Victoria McIntosh Scholarship for that year. Now, Mum had mixed feelings about this, happy for my success, but already worrying about our little boy going so far away. And so, in 1957, I went off to Edinburgh University to read history. And at the end of my studies, for reasons too complicated to go into in the time I've got available, I did not return to Gibraltar, but took up a teaching post in the Midlands of England. The school was run by the Christian Brothers, so in a sense I was renewing an association going back to my school days. By then I had married, and we settled down in England. However, I did not completely cut off myself from my home homeland 
Uh, we were here every summer during the long, lovely, long summer holidays that teachers used to have. Now, I want to fast forward now to the 1980s, uh, when my life changed quite dramatically. When my wife died in, in 1979, I had very important decisions to make. Although by then I was in line for the deputy headship in England, the urge to return to my rock grew apace. Friends thought that I was suffering from shock, not thinking straight, but in the end I returned to Gibraltar and took up a teaching post in Bayside. The early 80s were to prove life-changing years for me. I remarried in 1981, my daughter was born in 1982, and in 1984, the post of government archivist became available. Friends advised me, don't take it. It's a dead-end job. There is no prospects for promotion. But I took the plunge, I applied, and as you know, I was successful. I had had previous experience of the archives in the course of my research into the evacuation. More of that later, if time allows. So I knew I was taking on an enormous task. The archives at the time were, consisted of two rooms behind the convent, one of which was unusable because the floor, the floor had collapsed and the other was dark and gloomy. When I was introduced to the main part of the collection, I began to wonder what I had taken on. I opened the door to two large stores in Naval Hospital Hill and was confronted with literally mountains of papers which I was informed had been shoved off the back of lorries by Moroccan workers. During the next 20 years, the archives were transformed to what I think they look like today. The original rooms were refurbished. I gradually managed to acquire two, further, no, two new rooms. And the joke at the time amongst the GSP men at the gate there was that if I continued to expand, the governor would have to move to the mount. But that was, that was never, never on. Now, the documents were also gradually sorted out, boxed and labelled. And if you happen to visit the archives today, you will see the result there of 20 years of hard labour. There were also side effects to all this. I was called upon to do radio and television programmes, to give lectures, to write articles in the local press. Now, all along, I had been fascinated by the evacuation of the civilian population of Gibraltar during the Second World War. I found that when I started talking to people of my mother's generation, you just couldn't stop them. So I came to the conclusion that this was a story which had to be told. I began by going through the Gibraltar Chronicles housed in the Gibraltar Garrison Library, but soon realised that these only told half the story, the official version, if you like. It was then that I was introduced to the archives, never imagining that one day I would become the archivist, and there I found a wealth of material to work on. And the eventual result, of course, was the publication of The Fortress Came First, which I believe proved to be a very popular work locally. And having been bitten by the publication lark, I then went on to write three further books on the history of Gibraltar. In all these, I tried to focus on the social and political history of the rock, as opposed to the many books previously published, which tended to concentrate on its military aspects. In 1996 came Stories from the Rock, which was really an adaptation of many and varied episodes which I had previously used in my radio talks and newspaper articles. And many years went by before my next publication, Military Fortress, or commercial colony. The title is significant because throughout my studies of Gibraltar's social history, one theme kept cropping up, namely the peculiar position of Gibraltar vis-à-vis -vis the mother country. I mean, although by large Gibraltarians lived in peaceful harmony with their military masters and at all times showed great loyalty to the British crown, by the last decades of the 19th century, there were those who yearned for the civic rights which Britain was by then granting to some of her other outposts. Britain resisted requests of this nature on the grounds of Gibraltar's peculiar position as a fortress colony, since they said to grant such civic rights 
to the civilian inhabitants to be tantamount to endangering the security of the fortress. And so as a result, Gibraltarians moved into the 20th century, still ruled directly from London and without much hope, it would seem, of achieving civic rights, at least in the foreseeable future. And it was only after the Second World War that some tentative advances were made with the formation of the City Council before the war in 1921 and the first legislature in 1950. Since then, since then many more advances have been made and what was a military fortress has now become a thriving civilian community. And so here I am, all these years later. Hopefully, I have contributed little to the people's knowledge of the history of our small homeland. People of my generation tend to say that we are now in the departure lounge. My only hope is that the flight is delayed. <laughs> so, thank you.